Thank the Lord. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you, Suzanne and Peter and Tammy. Thank you for helping us to worship the Lord this morning. Thank all of you for coming out and braving the cold. Missed you. Praise the Lord. I'm two weeks off, I feel like I'm backslid. If I wasn't already so screwed up, I would have thought so, but praise the Lord. Amen. God is good. And I uh, appreciate, uh, again, all of you being here today. And glad to just be able to be back in the house of the Lord and be in the company of the saints. Praise the Lord. Amen. I want to uh, remind you, which you probably already are very aware of, but just be careful in that parking lot. Uh, they just plowed it, uh, I think, yesterday, the day before maybe, But because uh, I just told them to hold off. There wasn't any point in doing anything pushing snow if it keeps snowing every other day. So they finally just did it yesterday. But that place, I told uh, Mike when I got here, I said, you know, went to church and a hockey game broke out. If we'd have brought our skates, we could be out there high sticking each other right now. Praise the Lord. But anyway, God is good and uh, we're glad to have all of you with us. And James, I want to personally thank you. I have talked to you already about this, but uh, thank you for your ministry of music that you've uh, shared with us over the years. We're very grateful for it and, and uh, glad to, that, that God is going to use you in another way. Yes. And uh, our blessings just go with you. I love you and uh, God bless you, James. Have a great one over there. Yes. Something good for the Lord. Just keep up the good work and God's going to continue to use you. Yes. And uh, he works on both ends, so it's all good. Yes. Amen. He's not taking you away from us. He's just giving you to somebody else. Praise the Lord for a while. So it's good. Amen. Enjoy it. Get over there and mix with everybody and make good friends and be a blessing. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, amen. We're glad for that. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I was thinking about when uh, I, we had some family over uh, yesterday evening <clears throat> and uh, I was talking to my oldest son and daughter about when we, they lived with me when we lived out in uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania. And they were just small. In fact, they just had started to school. And I was working for a, a hotel out there, tending bar and steaming crabs and cooking and all kinds of crazy stuff. But it was, it was weird, but it was a good time. They still love my uh, fried bologna for breakfast. Praise the Lord, they never get over it. But uh, I was thinking about that's where I actually learned what little bit of Greek uh, that I know because that town, uh, Greencastle, Pennsylvania, is, a, is not a huge town. It's probably maybe the size of Ankeny or somewhere in that area. But uh, they had a, uh, it was all Greeks. I mean, it was almost, the whole town was filled with Greek immigrants. Uh, I, we lived in the hotel for a while, for several months. And then we rented an apartment. I rented an apartment. And the apartment was owned by Greeks. They lived in the same building. And we had the ground floor. They lived upstairs. You know how the row houses are out there on the East Coast. They're just one right after another. So that's the way we lived. And it's right on the street. You step out the front door and you're on the sidewalk, literally. And two steps, you're in the street, you know. So uh, there, were, there, there were several bars and restaurants and uh, dry cleaners. And, that, and they were all owned by these Greeks. The Greek would come over. He'd Eventually then he'd bring his brother or his nephew or his cousin. And they just keep, that's how they do it. You know, they give him a job at whatever business they got going until that person can get going well enough and they start a business. So the one fella had a, uh, a uh, tailor sh uh, shop and a dry cleaners and uh, his name was, uh, it was, I'll just say it was Papadopoulos, but it was something like that. You know, the, you know I'm, I'm, not, I'm not trying to be a bigot, but I just can't say all their names. But I had a pair of dress uh, pants, dress slacks that got ripped. <clears throat> I took them into him and to see if he could uh, repair them. And uh, here's what he said to me. He looked at the pants and he said, uh, Euripides? <laughs> and I said, yeah, Eumenides? <laughs> Euripides, Eumenides. Well, there's a little bit of truth to that. I actually lived in Pennsylvania, so <laughs> praise God. Amen. So God is good, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like a synonym. Is, that's a word that you use uh, when you can't spell the exact word you want to use. <laughs> praise the Lord. Sally was 
we were talking about uh, marriage and, and commitment. And she said, well, you know, marriage uh, means commitment, of course. And I said, well, yeah, but so does insanity. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But on a lighter note, my doctor said I needed an operation. And uh, so I asked him, I said, well, can I get an, a second opinion? And he said, yeah, you're ugly, too. Praise God. Okay, down to business. Praise the Lord. God bless all of you. Appreciate you being here. And uh, let's start with uh, Peter, if you would. I'd like to read uh, Psalms 90. Uh, let, no, let's do it this way. Exodus chapter 34, verse 10. Exodus 34 and verse 10. Praise the Lord. And I really appreciate the testimonies because they did speak some uh, very clearly to me uh, to the message that God has uh, given me to share with you this morning. And so in Exodus uh, 34 and verse 10, it says, He said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Now that is a covenant. I make a covenant. Jesus is the fulfillment of the covenants. He satisfies the demands of the covenant. Now this is spoken to Hebrews, but there are no Jews or Gentiles anymore. We are all in the covenant. So these covenants made to the Jews are as much ours as they are Jesus. And that covenant isn't fulfilled in the sense that Jesus came. What He satisfied was the sacrificial laws and rules and regulations and demands so that there wouldn't have to be any more sacrifices for sin or any of the other uh, reasons for sacrifices. So this covenant is still in effect. There are many covenants. You have the Abrahamic covenant, you have the Mosaic covenant, and there are all, uh, Davidic covenants. So there are all, all sorts of covenants that are still in effect as believers mm -hmm. outside of the covenant of the law demanding punishment or right. to satisfy the, the demands of the law. That was fulfilled in Jesus. The other covenants are ongoing. So this still exists and it's still for us. And this is relative to everything that was being said here this morning about what God is going to do and how He's going to do it and when He's going to do it and so on and so forth. All right? So with that in mind, let's look at uh, Psalms chapter 90, verses 16 and 17. So Jesus is the, you could say it this way, He's the enforcer of the covenants. The covenants were all words, all made with words. Jesus is that word made flesh. So He is the manifestation of these covenants. He's the means by which God will fulfill the covenants. In each one of us, individually, we have Christ in us. We have the covenants. We are, we're not separate from them. They're not something outside of us. They are literally a part of us. Praise the Lord. So He says, Let thy work appear unto thy servants, and thy glory unto their children. And let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Now this is exactly what was being shared here prior to the uh, song service or the worship part of the service. Praise the Lord. So let's go now to Revelation chapter 1 and verse 8. Praise God. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is which was and which is to come, the Almighty. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne, and has patience, for my name's sake, has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Okay, praise the Lord. The first love 
is uh, also defined as new love. How many of y'all remember first love? New love. I mean, it's a whole different thing, right? And it, it, it impacts you everywhere, physically, emotionally. You know, first love. Come on, get with me here. Praise the Lord. Maybe it's the person you're with. Doesn't matter. That first love is something unique. It's something special. And Jesus said, I've got something against you. We don't have this anymore. You've left your first love. And he said, I take this personally. Not, not mad, not angry, but I feel this, is what he's saying. I feel it personally when we don't share what we had in the very beginning. Where everything was supernatural. Everything was a possibility. Everything, God was going to do something new every day. I don't know about anybody else, but I remember when I got born again. And I don't say this to brag or anything else, but it was life-changing. It made me look at things altogether different. My, we went out, we knocked doors, we handed out tracts, we stopped traffic, we did anything and everything we could possibly do because I was in love with Jesus. I didn't know how to say that. I was always a little awkward with that kind of Joyce Meyer language, but I mean, yeah. that's what was happening. I had discovered something that literally impacted every part of my life. Nice. And it was awesome, and I couldn't wait for the next day to see what was going to happen, to see what he was going to do, see what was going to take place, you know. Because everything was possible. I mean, I'd look at the Bible and i think, my God, look at these miracles. It can happen to anybody. It can happen to everybody. We can have this. You know, this is what he wants us to ha enjoy, amen, and experience. So we're all on a journey. Amen. And it's a journey into this, this great mystery that God is progressively, ongoing, revealing to the human race. And he's been doing it since the beginning of time. He uses different methods at different times. But it's always been His will, His desire, His plan, His purpose. Amen? It's a, it's a prophetic vision, just like what Ron was sharing with us this morning. And it unveils this, the greatest revelation of Jesus Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen? That's what our whole life is supposed to be. You know, I thought I had got there. I thought I had arrived. I thought I knew it. Man, here, I got this revelation. I got some information I didn't ever have before. And, and it, I know it's true. I can feel it. It resonates with me spiritually and physically in every other way. Not realizing that that was just like coming out of the womb. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or you might say it was like the first date. Yeah. All excited about what it could be and might be and everything else, but not having any clue I mean, looking back after 40 years of marriage, believe me, I had no idea what we were. I, I, we had kids were there at the house, grandkids, great-grandkids. I was thinking of Tim talking. I had the newest great-granddaughter. Yeah, Ava. That was just born, what, three weeks ago? Had her in my arms, sitting in the chair. And just like Tim was saying, I was praying over her. I was saying, Lord, bless this little girl. Use her. Give her a life yes. that will reflect you. Yes. Help her to know you and to live for you and to share that with other people and so on and so forth. Yes. She had no clue what I'm saying. She only opened one eye a couple of times and I think that was out of self-defense <laughs> after she saw who was holding her. But she, you know, we don't know what, it's gonna, what her life will be. We trust that God's going to take care yeah. of her. But when I was getting married to Sally... When we were having children, I had no idea that one day I'd have 50-year-old kids sitting in my house and grandkids and great-grandkids and, and how, what an impact it would make and how different my life would be from what I thought it would be based on 25 years old or something, you know? So it's the way it is with Jesus. We thought, oh, we thought, man, what a romance. This is going to be so cool forever honeymoon. It's going to be great. All these good things are going to happen. And then you find out life smacks you right upside the face and now it begins to develop yes. it begins to turn into something yes. far deeper yes. far more impacting far more meaningful yeah. than what I thought was the biggest deal yes. that could ever happen in my life yes. and that's what Jesus is trying to show us as well don't lose yes. what got you into this thing in the first place because it's that is what will keep you I mean, how many of you ever have an issue with a spouse? 
I mean, it'd be really, I mean, and it happens all the time, we know that, to just say, enough of this crap, you know, I'm just, I'm done, I'm moving on, I'm through with it. No. It's, it's those, it's the patience that produces what God wants. It's patience that produces what we want in a relationship. Yes. And it takes the same thing with Him. He is not only our Heavenly Father, but He's our spouse. Yes. We are the bride of Christ. We're not on a honeymoon anymore. We've been married for a good long while. And it's time that we start seeing the fruit of that, the, 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 what, what God wants to produce from the relationship. Amen? So it's, a, it's like a, a prophetic vision like, like uh, Ron was talking about. The entire Bible is this unveiling or the unfolding of a more sure word of prophecy. The more sure word of prophecy is Jesus himself. Yes. He said, all the prophets spoke of me. They, all through the Bible, you read all the prophets, all of their prophecies, and they're all talking about me. It's all trying to get you to understand that it's about you and me. That more sure word of prophecy is realized as we look to Jesus. Continuously looking to Jesus. Yes. He's the author yes. and the finisher of our faith. Yes. All truth is progressive. And it ought to provoke thought. And ultimately, that should lead us then to spiritual revelation. All of the prophets of the Old Testament delivered messianic prophecies. All of them were about the coming king. Right? And then Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John come along, and they tell the story of the king who had come. Now here we are today, and our job is to testify of this same king presently reigning, amen, as the ascended one yes. who sits yes. at the right hand of God, yes. who's on the throne, amen? Yes. So he has this executive authority to administrate and release the kingdom of God. Yes. That's what he is. That's who he is. That's what he, in other words, he is the fulfiller of covenants. Yes. He is the one that satisfies the promise that God makes to us, to us, right. yes. by faith. Right. And it's even his faith. Praise the Lord. So, he, he gives us this uh, understanding of the kingdom of God as it's played out, amen, in the lives of us, in the lives of men and women on earth. Praise the Lord. Christ is the, the ever coming one. Praise the Lord. Not just a first coming and a second coming. He's always Coming. Yeah. Praise the Lord. He appears to Mary at the tomb. Yep. He appears to the disciples in the upper room. Yes. He appears to over 500 in the days between his resurrection and ascension. Yep. He appears to these men on the road to Emmaus. Yep. He appears to Thomas. Yes. He appears to Paul on the road to Damascus. He appears to John. On the Isle of Patmos. Yes. Jesus is appearing today. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. That's what I think Ron is talking about, yes. this prophetic word. This is what, uh, yes. what Don was speaking of and others here this morning, Jody. Yes. So look at, let's look at this. John chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. <coughs> As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth, and his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which is by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore, washed, and came seeing. Praise the Lord. Verse 24, we're going to read all the way through 34. Verse 24 through 34.
Then again called they the man that was blind and said unto him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. And he answered and said, Whether he be a sinner or not, I know not. One thing I know, whereas I was blind, now I see. Then said they to him again, what did, he do? what did he to thee? How opened he thine eyes? He answered them, I've told you already. Didn't you hear? Wherefore would you hear it again? Why would you want to hear it again if you didn't listen to me the first time? Will you also be his disciples? You want more information so you can follow him. And then they reviled him and said, Thou art his disciple, but we are Moses' disciples. We know that God spake to Moses. As for this fellow, we don't know where he came from. The man answered, uh, pardon me for paraphrasing, but the man answered and said unto them, Why herein is a, here is a marvelous thing that you don't know where he came from. And yet, he opened my eyes. I was talking to Jewish religious leaders, right? Now, we know that God hears not sinners. We know that God doesn't hear sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he heareth. Since the world began, was it not heard that any man opened the eyes of one that was born blind? If this man were not of God, he could do nothing. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins, and dost thou teach us? And then they kicked him out of the church. Praise the Lord. So, here's the deal. Some people say, belief in God, or faith in God, is a, a non-intellectual, or, or even an anti-intellectual reality. But here's the deal. The reverse could actually be true. I mean, we all hear, you know, really these, I'm not talking about the high church or the people that just have a bunch of doctrine that they want to spread around that are intellectual. But when you come to the people who actually put the word of God to action in their life, then they're idiots. These are morons. These are just foolish people, you know, just not good sense. But I think the opposite is the fact. He takes the foolishness of this world to confound the wise, what we call wise, what the world calls wise. Amen? So the reverse could actually be true. What if, what if genuine thinking faith doesn't demand that all of your questions need answers? Praise the Lord. The existence of doubt doesn't mean unbelief. Skepticism doesn't automatically invalidate hypothesis or theory. If it did, then scientific research would be absolutely irrelevant. There wouldn't be any such thing. Scientists know skepticism can lead to exploration. And that to deeper understanding. Refusal to believe usually isn't about inability to believe. It isn't that these people didn't have the ability to believe. They had all the scripture that there was. They had all the word of God that there was. They just chose not to believe. It, it interfered with their system, with their plans, with their understanding. Amen? But here's the deal. How you see Jesus is how you receive covenantal promises. It's the only way it can happen. Amen? When Jesus was physically here, Doubters were everywhere. I mean, we like to think, well, you know, Jesus come and man, he did a miracle and everybody just fell on their face and said, wow, this is God. No, that's not the case at all. Even with all the miracles, he still had doubters every place he went, even in his own family, his own brothers. It took the resurrection for them to come to a, to a real revelation that, of who he was. Enemies, critics, skeptics, they all disputed his claims to truth. They challenged his teachings, his actions, and, his, and especially his miracles, which is the opposite of what you would normally think. You'd think, well, the miracles, obviously, that would be a, a, a given. No, here we got a miracle right here, and they don't, they're, they're not going to believe it. They're not going to receive it. And they're not going to receive the man who worked the miracle. Right. Amen. So supernatural acts uh, developed faith in some people and unbelief in others. 
And we know that in our own life. Share a testimony of a miracle to some people, and they'll get all excited and giddy, and, and, and they want to believe, and they want to experience it, and say, share the same very testimony to somebody sitting next to them, and they'll think you're a complete idiot. And, you know, it was just a lucky happenstance. It was some sort of, uh, you know, uh, e eternal, you know, connection, you know, with the f earth force and nature and God only knows what else. But they'll come up with every excuse and any excuse to deny that it was a supernatural act of God. Amen. Look at Matthew uh, 12, uh, verse 24 through 28, Peter. Matthew 12, 24 through 28. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And Jews, Jesus knew their thoughts, and he said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. If Satan cast out Satan, he's divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? And if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God yeah. is come unto you. Praise the Lord. So there are honest doubters too. Amen. By that I mean sincere people who don't possess right information or the information doesn't make sense to them. Amen. Doubters that are looking for missing pieces of information are actually searching for revelation. They may not even know it to be defined as revelation. They're just trying to get more information about how to make this thing work. You know, how to, how to connect, how to do whatever it is you need to do. Amen. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Amen? Jesus is the Word of God. He's the only means by which we can have faith. And even the Bible itself, without Jesus, it's just words on a, in a book. I mean, you know people have read the same things we've read. Doesn't mean anything to them any more than a, you know, a Better Homes and Garden magazine. So, John chapter 20, 24 and 25, verses 24 and 25. What I'm saying is, we want to believe. We want to be totally sold out to whatever the Word of God says. But let's be honest. We know that isn't the case because we've all got questions. We believe it. We believe what He says, but we don't understand why it doesn't always work out exactly the way it says it. Now, all of us have challenges. Whether it's, you know, like Don was saying, a family member that passes away that we know is a believer that God would heal, wants to heal. Or whether it's a financial situation or, you know, relational, whatever it is. All of us have challenges in these areas. All of us have come up against things that didn't line up right. with the Word of God. Right. Maybe you're struggling with the situation right now, and you're thinking, well, I don't know why God hasn't done this for me. I know He did it for so-and-so, or somebody else got it, but He hasn't done it for me. And then we get onto the all these uh, paranoia kind of trips of, you know, like, well, nothing's ever going to get any better for me because God won't do it for me, and on and on and on. And even though we may not all express that verbally, it's probably gone through all of our minds at some point. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Praise the Lord. But Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. This is talking about the disciples when they were in the upper room. Jesus came to them. Thomas wasn't there with him, so he didn't see him. Right? This is after the resurrection. So the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see in his hands the print of the nails, put my finger into the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I won't believe it. Praise the Lord. These disciples, with the exception of Thomas, had all seen Jesus post-resurrection. All right? Thomas has honest doubt. He just wants some proof. Praise the Lord. Amen. It's not a hardness of heart. He's not rejecting Jesus or the potential that Jesus had to, you know, to provide salvation and all the, th and the fulfillment of the covenants and so on and so forth. He's just needing some evidence. Amen. He hadn't seen Jesus. Amen. And so this is this honest doubt and, and it's the result of the pain of disappointment. 
Right? Remember, even Mary, when she comes to the tomb, what's she there for? To bury, to finish the, 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 the uh, undertaking process, basically. And they weren't expecting, I mean, they knew what he had said, but they weren't there with the expectation of, you know, exactly. having a pat on the back from Jesus. They were there trying to fix up the rest of that natural body before it would be sealed up forever. Yeah. Amen? She goes and tells the disciples, they don't believe it either, that's why they came back. So if he's alive, this is, this is Thomas's deal. All the promises we had, and then we see him hanging on the cross. He's dead, and we know that he's dead. He's beaten to the place where we didn't even recognize him as a human being, yeah. and it's over. Yeah. And all of the things that we invested our lives into, and everything, all of the rejection from everybody else, and everything that we've done to see this reality, it's gone. Wow. So he's disappointed. He's thinking, I made the biggest mistake of my life. I, this is crazy. How am I ever going to overcome the humiliation of this thing and, and the, the disappointment of not having what he said we could have and what we were supposed to be experiencing? Amen? If he's alive, where is he? That's what he's saying. God deals with honest doubters with real patience. Thomas needs some patience. John chapter 20, 27 and 28. John 20, verses 27 and 28. Then said he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands. And reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. So faith floods back into Thomas. And the result is he falls on his knees and worships the Lord. Praise the Lord. He goes back to where it began. When he first knew he was the Lord. His first love. Back to the emotion and the, and the, the fulfillment of the promise and the dream and what it could be and what it might be. All of a sudden, all that comes back to life. Verse 29. And Jesus said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. I mean, does that seem unreasonable or harsh to you all? You know, yeah, you saw me and you believe. But blessed are those people who never seen me and still believed. So here's the question, I guess, that I ask myself. And I think the Lord was putting before me. Does that mean that there's a hierarchy of faith? Or a hierarchy of belief? Or does it mean that faith with evidence is less valuable than faith without evidence. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 7 through 13. Because sometimes, because we question, we give up the whole thing. Because we don't have the answer, because, we don't, because there are questions that have not been answered satisfactorily to us, we just throw our hands up and say, well, let's move on to something else because all I'm going to do is make God mad. Who was talking about questioning here today, you know? Praise the Lord. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth. Look, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at what? The appearing of Jesus Christ. That's almost a, a parallel of Thomas. Right? Whom having not seen, you love. And whom, though now you see him not, yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Praise the Lord. Continue on through th verse 13. Receiving the end of your faith, 
even the salvation of your souls, receiving the end of your faith. What is that? The, the, the fulfillment of whatever the promises are, right? Even the salvation of your souls, of which salvation? The salvation of your souls. He's not talking about your spirit because it's been dealt with immediately. It's the renewing of your mind or your soul that we're dealing with in this life at this point. So he says, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your intellect, your soul, your emotions, your personality, right? Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Yeah. Verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end, for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation yes. of Jesus Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. Amen. He yes. is the fulfillment yes. of everything. Yes. He And it's by grace yes. that we're going to experience this. Yes. It doesn't mean that we don't continue to strive for greater revelation and greater belief and everything else. But ultimately, it's our, our seeking after that. Our patience in trusting that what he has said is true, that the grace comes to reveal it, to fulfill it. Praise the Lord. Hebrews uh, 11 one says that faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we don't see. Evidence supports faith, right? But it may not always be empirical. In other words, empirical just simply means uh, the result of an experiment or something that you actually see. Amen. Evidence. Obser observable evidence. Amen. Or immediate evidence. But here's the deal. Skepticism can be a response to things that we don't understand. All right, just think about, I'm going to think about this. Grandkids. Great grandkids. Even your own kids when they were small. What do they do? Why, 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 why? Just question after question after question after question. All it could be the simplest thing, and you think, just, hey, just believe it, okay? Yeah. Why? Uh -huh. yeah. You know, why are the dog is chasing the rat? Why? Yeah. The birds are sitting on the tree limb. Why? why? Yeah. The dog chased me. Why? Yeah. Why? Get in the back seat and fasten your seat. Why? See, it, it starts in childhood as a way or a need to question everything that we don't understand. How, I wonder if the Lord ever does this, but I know I have. To, just do it. You'll know, you'll know why later, okay? You're not going to understand if I explain to you why anyhow. Don't get on the garage anymore. Because you'll fall. Why? Gravity. Why? What's gravity? See, there's just no point in going on with this because just get off the roof. You know? Now, I don't think God does that, but I wonder if there aren't times when he goes, ooh, boy, I'd like to have a conversation with him like he had with that grandkid. Because there's so much we don't understand. Just like with them. They don't understand because they haven't experienced it. All they, do, all they know is what we've told them. All they know is what they've heard. So doubt can protect us from bad decisions. From making poor choices. From being disappointed. Actually, doubt can protect us from negatives. The problem is it also binds us to reality. Jesus answers Thomas' demand for this empirical evidence. And Thomas goes from cynicism to worship. Praise the Lord. Luke 24, verses 33 through 40. Praise the 
praise the Lord. They rose up the same hour and returned. Now these are the, the, the men on the road to Emmaus. Jesus meets them. And then he, by using the word of God, he, he goes throughout the scriptures and he shows them him everywhere in the Bible. He reveals himself by the word of God. So they rose up the same hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven gathered together and them that were with them. Now this is the original apostles or disciples. Saying the Lord is risen indeed and hath appeared to Simon. Praise the Lord. Keep going through verse 40. And they told what things were done in the way and how he was known of them in breaking of bread. He broke the bread and immediately they recognized him after he had told them all the things in the scripture. And as they thus spoke, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. Now these are the guys that just saw him. And they're here testifying to the guys who had seen him before when Thomas wasn't with them. Right? And he said unto them, Why are you troubled, and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So the other disciples experienced disbelief too. Yeah. Even after having seen him. Jesus shows them his hands and his feet, and they still don't believe. Now, it must have made them feel really good to talk to Thomas. And Thomas says, I ain't believing this until I see something. And they probably all went, oh, what a shame. Knowing they were, they were exactly like Thomas. Praise the Lord. Verse 41. Now, look at this. This blows my mind. And while they yet believed not for joy... And wondered, he said unto them, Have ye here any meat? Now he's, already, he's just told them it's him. They already said they recognized him on the road to Emmaus. They come back. The guys that had already seen them are there. And they said that they knew it was him, right? And now he's speaking to them and showing them his hands and his side. And they still not believing. <clears throat> he says, While they yet believed not for joy and wondered, he said unto them, Got anything to eat? They still didn't believe it. Now get this, because of joy and amazement. I don't know about you, but that almost gives me a headache. I guess you had to be there. You know, I mean, it's one of those things. I don't know how to explain it. He's showing them. He's shown them over multiple times now, and he's shown them again. And they're amazed, and they're, they're just, it's like joy unspeakable. But they still don't believe. Yeah. It's like too big. It's too much. It's too beyond. Yeah. Praise the Lord. So Thomas wasn't alone. All of the disciples had their faith revived. All of them struggled with doubt. Right. These are the apostles. Right. The ones we call saints today. And the truth is, they are exactly like you and me. Yes. Who also happen to be saints, by the way. Yes. Praise the Lord. I can't count the times that Jesus has met me in my faith fog, if you will. Amen. Where I know what it says. I've seen it. I've seen him in the word. And yet... I need some evidence. I need something. This thing that I'm dealing with is so big and it's so real to me. And I'm so disappointed in the fact that I'm having to deal with it. That it's hard for me to keep my focus on him and his promise and his fulfillments. My, my fog, if you will, of, of unbelief, it, it's... You know, it's incomplete. It's inadequate perception. Right. And it creates intellectual confusion. Yes. yes. Now, there's, there's spiritual truth here for every one of us. It's how we relate to God. 
It's how we relate to miracles. It's how we receive the promises that he wants to give us. Now, there's a reason for everything happening the way it happens, whether we understand that or not. So I'm believing that 2019 is all that, that Ron shared with us this morning. Not just because Ron shared it this morning, but because it's already in me to expect these things or to want to see these things. I just don't know how. Because I've been wanting to see it and experience it. And we've had bits and pieces for 35 years. Why now? You know, so there's been disappointment through the years. Not a... I mean, and some skepticism, but not a, a unbelief, not, not that I don't believe it. It's just, come on, I, I need to see something. Yeah. I, I, I want to just say, yeah, and I do. But then there's challenges that come. Time, seven days, nothing's happened. I haven't seen him. Where is he? What's the deal? You know, he promised he was going to do this, and now it hasn't happened. And I'm sure, let me see something. Give me a, let me see a nail print. Let me. Touch the side. Let, yeah. Praise the Lord. I'm not trying to be negative. I'm trying to be honest about this because I think that's how the Scripture is trying to get us to understand. God's going to do this, yes. but He needs some people that will believe yes. against unbelief, yes. who will trust that His Word, that we're, we may say, hey, show me, a, give me a sign, show me something. God's not angry with that. He's patient. He's long-suffering with that because He wants this thing to come to pass. And the only way it can come to pass is by us believing and acting and stepping out in faith on what His Word is. So He's going to give us, and I think we have had some signs. Yes. Yes. Amen? I think, Jane, uh, situations in our family, uh, you know, financial things, uh, healings, delivery, pieces. Where He said, go ahead, touch. Touch my, the whole, touch, put your hand on my side. He's given us some evidence, some things that are empirical, amen, so that we can believe for the long run, for the big stuff that has to come to pass based on what his word is. Those little things, amen, were the kind of things that the disciples saw that made them want to believe, even in the face of everything that was telling them intellectually, this is ridiculous, man. You've seen a lot of funerals, haven't you? You ever seen a guy look like that right. and come back? Right. Yeah. yeah, Lazarus, so he had something. We don't know what he had, but he, he, just, he just went to sleep. This guy was murdered. Yeah. Praise the Lord. John 9, verses 1 and 2 again. Because I think we hear testimonies, and it's not just wishful thinking. We've got the Word of God for this. And it's in our heart because of the Spirit of God that bears witness with His Spirit. This Word is Spirit and it's life. Amen. It's not just words on a page to us. And that inspires us. That encourages us. That drives us. Amen. For the reality of the fulfillment of all of this. And God is patient to ultimately give us grace for this to come to pass. It isn't just about how strong your faith is. You need faith, obviously. But our faith drives us, pushes us to get answers, to get results, to get what we need. And then God, because of that, our, our, our unwillingness to just give up because we don't have empirical evidence, God gives us grace so that we can experience what He has promised. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Born blind. Everything else works. Do you ever think about it? He can smell perfectly. He can hear. He can walk. He has a sense of touch, taste. He's got a good mind, probably. He just can't see. So he's blind. And this guy struggles to overcome the reason or the purpose of his limitation or his problem, his issue. Amen. And he wonders, is begging all I was meant to do? Is this my life? Is this the way it's going to always be? He's humiliated. He's in hopelessness. He's in poverty. He doesn't see Anyway, 
that anything's going to change. Anybody been there? Praise the Lord. Ongoing thing. Just doesn't yeah. seem to go away. You know you got a word from God, but it just keeps on happening. Yeah. Other things around that, the peripheral area, seem to be going okay. I got an answer here. I got a blessing here. But this thing, what is it about this thing? And he wonders, is begging what I was created for? Is this was all I was ever meant to do? So he rattles his beggar's bowl to get their attention. And now it's weird because they're talking about him like he's not there. They're talking about him like he's just a theological problem, like he's just some abstract theory or, or thought. Who sinned? This guy or the parents? Now think about it. This guy's right there hearing all this stuff. He can't see. He doesn't... He can't picture the whole thing, but he's hearing everything they're saying about it. Yeah. And then he hears another voice. Verse 3. Jesus answered, Neither has this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. So this isn't about negative consequences for bad choices. But so that one day, God could show in him what he could do. Yeah. Now, take that personal. Yeah. Yeah. You may be going through some stuff. You may be having some issues. And you think, is this the way it's always going to be? I mean, is it never going to change? Is it always going to be like this? Why is this thing always like this? Why doesn't it get better? Because God wants to show in you His power, yes. His promise, yes. the fulfillment. Yes. The blind guy's thinking, really? I've asked God to open my eyes and let me see the world around me a million times. Ever since I've been old enough to have a conscious thought, I've been thinking, I've been praying, I've been asking, I've been wondering, but nothing ever changes. Verses 4 and 5. I, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. As long as I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. All right? Now remember, the blind guy's hearing all this stuff. And he's thinking, what a weird speech. This guy's claiming to be the source of light in the world. He must be on some real ego trip. I mean, what's the deal with this? You know? Verse 6 and 7. When he had thus spoken, he spat on the ground, made clay of the spittle, and he anointed the eyes of the, man, the blind man with the clay, and said unto him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which by interpretation sent. He went his way, therefore washed, and came seeing. Praise the Lord. So the blind man hears somebody spit, and then he feels somebody grabbing him and smearing something on his eyes. Now get this, this is a guy who nobody touches. The only, only time he feels the touch of another human is if his parents are nearby. Right. Amen? And then they only touch him when they want to lead him someplace. But he doesn't fight the stranger's touch, which would be natural to do if you never have any interaction physically with people. But he doesn't. He just, he's just afraid of being a laughing stock of the beggar community. He's just afraid of disappointment. He's just afraid that I get my hopes up. I mean, it's been how many times I've asked for this, I've prayed for this, I've wanted something. He's just afraid to exercise faith for fear that I'll just be disappointed again. You know, sometimes it's easier just to wallow in your disappointment than it is to pull yourself up and put your faith in God no matter what. Right. And he goes, it's light. It's, it's light. It must be light, but, but it can't be. I'm blind. Yeah. But it is. Yeah. And the blind guy sees. So let's go back to Exodus 34, verse 10 again.
he, Jesus said, God had made a plan and a purpose for your life. And the reason you had this didn't come from God. But God's going to use it so that he can fulfill his covenant with you. So he can keep his word to you. And he said, Behold, I make a covenant before all thy people. I will do marvels such as have not been seen or done in all the earth, nor in any nation. And all the people among which thou art shall see the work of the Lord, for it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. It's an amazing thing. It's going to be yes. mind-blowing what yes. I'm going to do. You, this is Jesus yes. keeping this covenant yes. in this man. Yes. And he wants to do the same thing for you yes. and for me. And for all that will just hang in there, yes. just hold on. Yes. Amen. Amen. Psalms 90. Praise the Lord. Verses 16 and 17 again. Let thy work appear unto thy servants and thy glory unto their children. Man, that's my prayer. That's my confession. Let the beauty of the Lord our God be upon us. And establish thou the work of our hands upon us. Yea, the work of our hands establish thou it. Praise the Lord. And then the big controversy comes. Was it God or was it the devil? You get your miracle. And then half of the people want to say, it was the, do the doctor's misdiagnosed. Yeah. You know, or the bank made a mistake. Yeah. Or you just got lucky. Your stars were aligned. The Pharisees in religion are saying that. You, look, you don't know God. We know God. We've got the answers. You don't know sick him. The guy said, well, I, I'm not saying I know anything. All I know is I was blind, but now I'm seeing something happened. Something changed. Praise the Lord. And they're saying, well, we know Abraham. We don't know this guy. And this, <laughs> this blind guy is pretty cool, actually, because he, in a way, this is what he says. I don't know the colloquialism of the time, but basically what he said was, uh, well, uh, I'm not sure, but I would think that if you are the spiritual people you're supposed to be, you would know the people that God is using. Yeah. Are you going to try to teach us now? Well, now they're mad because yeah. he's questioning yeah. The things that he has always accepted in the past. Now all of a sudden he's saying, wait a minute, God's doing stuff that I never knew he would do or could do or wanted to do. Amen? John 9, verse 34 through 38. This blind guy, one of the things you find is his healing is the longest miracle story in the Bible. The whole yeah. way it unfolds. It's the longest miracle, the longest story of a miracle that takes place in the Bible. They answered and said unto him, Thou wast altogether born in sins. Are you going to teach us? And they kicked him out of the church. Jesus heard that they had kicked him out. And when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe on the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he? Lord, that I might believe on him. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and it is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Wow. Praise the Lord. So this, this story, is, it's filled with all kinds of theology. In fact, some pretty deep theology, if you want to really look at it, like who Jesus really is. Amen? And religion's inability to see Him yes. manifest. Yes. Praise the Lord. So this main character, this blind man, he struggles with blindness in two different ways. He can't see the physical sunlight or the sunlight. He can't see it physically. And he can't see the light of the world spiritually. But his gradual move toward belief and spiritual sight is a model for faith to each and every one of us. 
Praise the Lord. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 9. Because we're all born blind, yeah. spiritually. Yeah. And all this is, is a metaphor for that. Yeah. He's physically blind, but the whole nation is spiritually blind, including himself. But his willingness to come to Jesus and to allow Jesus to do what Jesus wants to do, even though it's uncomfortable, even though it's un, uh, unusual and different from anything he's experienced, is evidence that he's wanting to see physically, right? But the result is the physical sight also opens him up to spiritual sight. Yes. And the, the parallel here is for us, if we keep seeking, if we keep looking, if we keep trusting, God will do what only God can do. He'll open our spiritual eyes. Yes. He'll open us up to all that God has for us and everything that He wants to do in your life. Amen. To show Himself mighty on your behalf. To do like Jesus said, the reason God, this man is blind is so that God can show not everybody else, but this man. The promise that He has for him. Which is, I'll never leave you or forsake you. I'll meet every need that you have according to my riches and yes. glory by Christ Jesus. I want to give you things. I want to do things for you that no man has experienced. I want you to be a receptacle of the supernatural power and anointing of Almighty God. Yes. Praise the Lord. God. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season... If need be, you are in heaviness through manifold temptations. These are saved, born-again people. Wherein you greatly rejoice, though now, for a while, if it's necessary, you're in heaviness through temptations. This isn't being tempted to go get high. This isn't tempted to go commit adultery. This is a temptation to not believe God. To think that this is just the way it is, it's never going to change, it'll always be like this, and it's just as good as it's going to get. Right. That the trial of your faith may, the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ, mm -hmm. whom having not seen, you love, in whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of everything, your understanding, your reason, your revelation, and so on and so forth. Praise the Lord. Anybody can take this journey. Amen. We are all born blind to spiritual light. Sin is unbelief. That's all it is. It's coming short. Coming short of what? Of believing what God says about any given situation. So our blindness can take different forms. And the scripture says all have sinned. And we prove it every day. But we can all walk. We can all grope or run toward God's light. Grace. Metaphorically, the Pharisees represent people who refuse Jesus as God in a human body. And they have different reasons for that, but that's irrelevant. They just won't go there. It's like spitting in somebody's eye. Sorry, that doesn't fit my paradigm. So don't be spitting on me or putting mud in my face or whatever. They're, they're religious. In fact, they're very religious. They're just not open to what God wants to do. They like to tell God what He can do and how He can do it. Their form of blindness is self-righteousness. Receiving <clears throat> their intellect over the truth of God's Word. Earth man and the saliva of God. Talked about it before, but it's God and man coming together. And the result is what? Perfection. 
whatever was wrong is not wrong anymore. He's not blind anymore. Not blind physically and not blind spiritually. Because the moment he says, who is this? This Son of God, this Lord. And Jesus said, it's me. It's the guy you've been talking to. The guy you see. The first man you've seen. And the one that's talking to you right now. And he said, I believe. He immediately... He comes into relationship with Jesus. Immediately, he has a revelation. The greatest revelation that anybody can ever have. Not only is he seeing naturally now, he's seeing spiritually. He sees this is God in the flesh. This is the one who made the promise in Exodus. The one who led us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praise the Lord. The blind guy represents this relentless following of spiritual light until it reaches the light of the world. Let me ask you about your life rhetorically, but just think every one of us come to Jesus somewhere and most of us are ways back down the road without any of the revelation or the understanding or very little of what we have today. We had some understanding. We knew that he existed. We didn't know all of the other stuff. How, how, how are we here where we are here? I mean, why are we here today? Because of the relentless pursuit, even in our ignorance, even in our, uh, our limited knowledge, and God just keeps pulling and pulling because He said, I've got a promise that I made to you, and I have to keep it. But it's partially dependent on you, on your continued pursuit. Because where you stop, I stop. If you stop at the Baptist church, and I'm not speaking against Baptists, then then, friend, that's where you're at. That's where your God is. That's what He is. But if you need healing, you better go a little further down the road to where somebody believes for healing. Right? I'm not saying, I'm not talking about denomination. I'm not against anybody. I'm just saying, God wants to open our spiritual eyes to all that He is. And it takes a continuous pursuit. Now, the Holy Spirit leads us, and by grace, we are here. We are believing for more. We are expecting more. But that's because inside of us is this promise that says, I'm going to do some stuff that nobody has ever seen before, and I'm going to do it through somebody who will believe me, who will trust me. This guy was born blind. Is this all this there ever going to be? I mean, I'm, thank God I've got my mind. Thank God I can still walk. I can still get around. But come on. Lord, I want to see. I, I, want, I want to experience everything that you've promised in life. And I'm going through this whole thing in the dark. And God said, only because I want to show you something that will keep my promise and fulfill your desire. I want to do some miracles. And the healed man prays a three-word prayer. Lord, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. You want a good prayer to pray? Yeah. Even when you can't see? Yeah. Sure. Even when you're still hoping for right. that encounter with yes. God Almighty? Yes. Lord, I believe. Yes. Help my unbelief. Yes. Yes. Now you can understand what that man was talking about, right? Yes. Because we try to churchy yep. elevate ourselves to where we're saying, oh, I believe everything. I believe what this word says, but I got to tell you, I have questions sometimes. I have yeah. doubts. I have, I have concerns. Yeah. And if you let those stop you, yeah. you'll be sitting by the side of the road with a beggar's bowl for the rest of your life. Right. But if you'll keep pushing, if you'll keep trusting, if you'll keep believing, God's got the plan that's going to unfold in your life and give you the desires of your heart. The thing that He has promised you clear back in Exodus 34 will come to pass, even if it has to come to pass in John or in Romans or in 2 Corinthians or Acts or even in the book of Revelation. The only contingency is that you keep believing. Without faith, it's impossible to please Him. Praise the Lord. In the Old Covenant, when a sinner would come to God, he would have to come through the mediator of a priest. This is the story that the disciples are basically sharing. Who sinned? Right? But they would bring the lamb 
before the priest, the mediator, and he would have to bring this, this spotless lamb or this sacrifice as a sin offering. And the guy, the man bringing the offering would lay his hand on the, on the lamb, and then he'd give it to the priest, and the priest would confess the sins over that lamb. The sins of the man would go on the lamb. The priest would examine the lamb head to toe. And if the lamb was spotless, he'd be accepted as a sin offering. Right? Without ever looking at the person who he is offering the sacrifice for. Amen? Everybody's examining the blind guy here. They're looking at his problem and saying, okay, what caused this? Think about it. You got an issue. You got a healing. You got a, this that you need. You got this that you got to have. And what are we doing? We're looking at us to see why it we isn't are. happening. We are. That's true. What did I screw up? What did I do? What haven't I done? Don't I love God enough? Don't I do this? Don't I haven't, haven't I done this? Haven't I done this or that or the other thing? When all God is saying, look at the lamb. It's just, yeah, yeah, yeah. He's perfect. Yes, you're flawed. But I'm not looking at you. I'm looking at your sacrifice. I'm looking at Jesus. Why haven't I got the healing? You need to get to Jesus. Is it because I'm so screwed? It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with your sacrifice. We're not examined. Only the Lamb. Only Jesus. Focus not on your problem. Focus on Jesus. Quit talking about your problem. Talk about Jesus. Quit telling me why it can't happen because it hasn't happened because God wants it to come to pass. He gave your... You have the same promise from Exodus 34 and Psalms 90. That's yours. You're in covenant with God. That's your promise. This blind man had the same promise. But he had to get to Jesus. He had to keep the focus on Jesus and not on him. And I, and I look, I, I sympathize. I empathize with people's issues and problems because I got them too. But just let me tell you, as much as you may want sympathy... Maybe it's even subconscious. You, sympathy is not what you need. No, no, no. This guy didn't need more sympathy. He was feeling sorry enough for himself as it was. I don't know why. I prayed many times and God hasn't done it for me. And why didn't this happen for me? And how come I'm blind and they're not blind? And how come you know, they're talking about me and my mama? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The moment you put the focus back on Jesus, yeah. it happens. Well, it hasn't happened for me. Please. I mean, I don't know. I'm a a relatively sympathetic person. But I'm not very good at showing emotions. Although God has a way of slapping me around sometimes and makes me cry in front of people like a little girl. It's very uncomfortable. But that's not my nature. And it's not, I mean, I I feel empathy in, in that for people. But sometimes it just... I want to just say something that I shouldn't say. It just really upsets me. It, it makes me angry. Because I've got the same doubts everybody else has. Exactly. Same questions come to my mind. Right. The same wondering why this didn't happen or why that happened. How come it happened here, right. but it didn't happen here? How come a stranger that I pray for gets healed, gets delivered, gets raised from the dead? Right? right? In yeah. Oklahoma. And I pray for a brother. And... So don't, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm not unsympathetic. I'm not unconcerned about your situation. But come on. It works. It only works one way. And he's not going to make a special kind of thing for you because you feel more upset about it than somebody else does. We got to believe that it's my pressing into this, my continuous saying, God, you're right. No matter what happened here, I don't understand this. I don't know if I did something wrong or they didn't or they chose some other avenue or whatever it is. I don't know. But what I do know 
is that you are perfect. Your word cannot fail. You have said that it will come to pass. It must come to pass. And the only thing that's going to get my fulfillment, it's the only thing that's going to get me the completeness of who I am and what God has promised in Isaiah or in, in Exodus chapter 34 and Psalms 90 is if I keep pressing on. If I keep saying I don't understand all of this, but I know that God is not a liar. That God must bring it to pass if I don't give up. Just rattle the bowl. Yes. I'm still here, Lord. Yes. I don't have all the answers, but you do, and I'm not leaving until I get the answer. I'm here because you gave me a promise. You're going to bring your reality out of me. You're going to bring healing out of me. You're going to bring deliverance out of me. You're going to bring every promise that you have. You said I've given it to you. And it's going to be awesome. It's going to be terrible. It's going to be so freaky, it will be terrible. It will be weird. But it will just be the fulfillment of God. Praise the Lord. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. I don't know how old this guy was. He was blind from his birth. However old he was, this is all he'd ever known. For the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers unto the, thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. That's part of our problem. We still have conscience of sin. We still are like these disciples saying, who sinned? Yep. Somebody must have sinned or he wouldn't be blind. And Jesus saying, no. Look, this is about God wanting to do something so supernatural in this man that this man will never be able to deny the reality of God again. Not only will he see, but he'll have spiritual sight like he'd never imagined possible. If we struggle with blindness, if we struggle with unbelief, it's because we don't fully understand that the works of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ once and for all time took care of our sin, past, present, and future, and that He has fulfilled every covenant of God that it, so that it can manifest in our lives. Hebrews 10, 6 through 14. See, this blind guy only had one problem he was blind. Otherwise, he was okay. He was perfect. He was like everybody else. He could see. He could, or he could hear. He could taste. He could smell. He could touch. He could walk. He could do all those other things. It's just the one thing. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, lo, I come. In the volume of the book, it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hast pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, lo, I come to do thy will. I come to do thy will, O God. I come to fulfill your covenants, Lord. I come to make your word true. I come to make your word alive and real in people's lives. And he said, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the body or through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be his, <coughs> made his footstool. Yep. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. This is perfection. Yes. And that's what he's telling us. That by that one offering, if you see yourself as he sees you, perfect. Perfected because of the spotless sacrifice. You're not blind anymore. Whatever the problem was, you're now perfect in Christ. Praise the Lord. By one offering, He has perfected forever them that sanctified. This guy used to beg. This blind guy used to beg because he was blind. 
And that's what happens when you're under religious bondage. It's a bondage that keeps us blind to who we are in Christ and makes us feel like we need to go to God and beg Him for what we need. I promise you this blind guy, he did plenty of complaining. It wasn't that when he heard Jesus' voice, all these thoughts just come up and he just starts thinking, you know, wow, I've been wanting to be healed for a long time. What happened? I promise you, through the years, he has complained to everybody that would listen to him. I don't know why I'm blind. I, didn't, I don't deserve this. I never did anything wrong. Why didn't God do this for me? How come he did it for Joe Blow down here? I see he, I heard that he got his sight back and I haven't got my sight back. How come God isn't doing it for me? It's breaking my heart. It's killing me. I don't understand it. Where you stop, God stops. If you're more satisfied with sympathy than you are the covenant being fulfilled, then that's what you're stuck with. Hallelujah. We don't have to beg God. We don't have to plead with God. We don't have to twist God's arm. God has a covenant with us that says if you just will believe, I'm going to fulfill it. I just need people to believe it. I just need people to not give up on it. I need people to go through the trial of your faith. Well, I, my trial's long enough. It's not your choice. You don't get to pick the parameters of how this works. You just got to believe. Yeah. So you say, well, you know, so it's, it's because we don't have a vision, the people perish. That's not the vision he's talking about. He, the vision in, in, in Proverbs 29 is, we, we think it's about, okay, let's have a vision for the church. Yeah. Right? Let's all get together and we'll come up with a vision. And uh, the vision is we're going to, do this and that, and we're going to have this, and we're going to add to that, and we're going to do some other thing, and, and we're going to, you know, have a, uh, a plan. We're going to come up with a program that's going to make everything work. I've had more programs and more plans and, ha and read more books on church uh, uh, beginnings and uh, home missions, churches, and everything else. I've, I've, I've read all of the books on it. Praise the Lord. But apparently I never got a vision. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I've tried a lot of different things. We gave away bicycles. We gave away that. We did this. We had this Bible. We, did, we brought people in. We fed people. We did. And I'm not saying we shouldn't do that anyway. Right. But the problem is sometimes the vision becomes just something we do right. thinking that it's an exchange. Right. Well, if I do enough of this stuff, then God's going right. to right? build the church. He's going to do whatever he is. Praise the Lord. The vision that he's talking about in Proverbs 29 isn't dealing with a plan or a program like we would call a vision. It's the world shazam. Gomer would say shazam, but I'm saying shazam because that's the way it is. It's a Hebrew word that means to dream, revelation, or oracle. Literally, what he is saying is that without a vision or without a revelation of Jesus Christ, without a prophetic vision, an oracle, the people perish. Yeah, yeah. That's true. Praise the Lord. Yeah. It's not about coming up with another eight-step plan for church growth. No. It's about opening our eyes yes. to the promise of God Amen. and remaining faithful to it. John 9, 1 and 2 again. Jesus passed by. He saw a man which was blind from his birth. His disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Praise the Lord. James 5, 14 and 15. James 5, 14 and 15. Praise God. Mike knew this was coming. Praise the Lord. Prophetic. He is. Hallelujah. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed any sins, they shall be forgiven him. Praise the Lord. There, right in the middle of a uh, healing scripture, James tells us that if 
we commit any sin, even our sins can't stop God from healing us. That's called grace. If you can be healed, even when you come short, what is sin? What did we say sin was? Unbelief. Praise the Lord. If we can still be healed because of our imperfect faith, everything else can happen the same way. Praise the Lord. Even sin can't stop God from healing us, from delivering us, from prospering us, from fulfilling His promises. In John 9, not only do they accuse the blind man of being a sinner, they accuse Jesus of being a sinner. John 16, 7, and 7 through 14. Praise the Lord. I'll talk faster. We're about done here. Praise God. I knew that this would happen after two weeks off. I can't find a place to stop where I'm supposed to. Praise God. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. This is what Don was talking about. Who's doing this? The Holy Spirit. If I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness, and of judgment. Praise God. Of sin, because they believe not on me. Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit is to convince you, amen, of your righteousness. Once you really see you are righteous and just, then the just will live by faith. If you don't believe you're just, you're not going to live by faith because you'll figure what's the point. In other words, if you believe you are righteous, that's your identity. That's who you are. That's who God deals with. That's who the Holy Spirit is speaking to. Yes. The Holy Spirit has a hard time telling you to do things that you don't feel adequate. Right. That you don't feel, you know, I'm not good enough for this. Right. So you have to be convinced, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. He convinces you of your righteousness so He yes. can connect with you, so He can interact with you, so He can talk to you, so that you can yes. hear Him. Yes. Every, every, uh, every, Roadblock, every uh, kind of point of resistance, whether it, they're all the same. It's sickness, disease, poverty, relational, whatever it is. All of those things are to get you to take your mind off of who you really are, yes. what God has promised you, and what the Holy Ghost can do for you. Right. The Holy Ghost can't do anything for you if you don't trust to be led by the Holy Spirit. Right. And you won't be led by the Holy Spirit if you think God is, is cheating you or being unfair with you. Right. How come so-and-so? Look, I don't know about so-and-so. I, I don't really care about so-and-so. It doesn't affect me. I don't know what their relationship is. I don't know why God's doing what He's doing in their life or what they're experiencing or why they're experiencing it. It doesn't matter. This is about me and God, not about somebody else and God. Because God deals with us as individuals. He's not dealing with me based on Jody. He's not dealing with Sally based on Don. It's irrelevant. He's, based, he's dealing with us based on Jesus. Yes. 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 And each one of us is perfect in Christ. Yes. Praise the Lord. The Holy Spirit convinces you of your righteousness. Praise God. John 9.35 Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, the blind man, heard that they had kicked him out of the church. When he had found him, he said to him, Dost thou believe on the Son of God? So my question this morning, and I believe it's the, the Lord is saying this, do you believe? Because that's the only requirement of new covenant belief. That's it. 
of new covenant promises fulfilled? Believe. Even when you don't fully understand. How many things in this world do we not understand and yet believe in? God, I mean, more than I know, more than I understand. Planes, flight. I mean, come on. Electricity. I mean, it's crazy. And yet we put our confidence in it. Never question. We don't need to ha take a, a, a three-year course, you know, in electronics to know that if I flip the switch on, it's going to work. Yeah. Right? I mean, I just, I just know. Yes. Praise God. Yeah. Even when you don't fully ever understand. Because everything else flows out of what you believe. Verses 37 and 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou hast both seen him, and is he that talketh with thee. And he said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Thou hast both seen him, and it's he that's talking with you. And he'll never leave you or forsake you. So just understand today. Praise God. The Lord is both talking with you and you are now seeing Him. Yes. Not here, not me. In the Word. Yes. Which is God. Yes. You've both heard Him and seen Him. Yes. What should happen in our life is worship yes. and praise. Regardless of how much I understand. Exactly. Praise the Lord. Believe God. Hope against hope. Right. And then go your way. Seeing Jesus. Yeah. And seeing yourself as He's defined you. Yeah. Complete and perfect in Him. Yeah. Praise the Lord. Revelation 1 and 8. I am Alpha Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come. Almighty. How you see Jesus is how you receive Jesus. Jesus identifies with us in the Alpha. Literally, in the first son. Jesus completely identified with Adam and the old creation. And he took the Alpha son, the first son, to the cross. And I nailed him there. With your help. Praise the Lord. We are drawn into the death and resurrection with Him. And the result is Jesus became the Omega Son, the last Adam. God, our Father's vision, is so centered on Jesus as me that all of God's wrath was fully satisfied and Moses' law was fulfilled. Yes. Fully met. Yep. God didn't circumvent the law. No. You got everything you deserved. Yes. Praise the Lord in Christ. Yes. Romans 8.11 But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Jesus identified with the fallen state of the first Adam. Praise the Lord. He, Jesus, became what we were in the Alpha Son, praise the Lord, so that we would become what he is in the Omega Son, praise the Lord. He destroyed the first man, Adam, praise the Lord, through death, through the cross, through the crucifixion, amen. And through his resurrection, he became the last Adam, and he brought forth a brand new species, which is you and I. Yes. 
Praise the Lord. When John saw him, he said, I fell at his feet as dead. John reckoned his old man was dead. Anytime you see Jesus, whenever you really get a revelation of Jesus, you're going to fall at his feet and say, I'm dead and my life is hid with Christ in God. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. And I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. Because of the covenant, God's word made flesh or manifest in me. Yes. Praise the Lord. Every promise, it's in you. Yes. It's in us to fulfill. But our, our responsibility is simply to keep pressing. <laughs> keep, keep on keeping on. And God will do what only God can do, and He's going to do it through us. Yes. Praise the Lord. Yes. I say it's time to suck it up. Yes. Amen. Honestly, be, be grown-up Christians. Yes. Fight the fight of faith. Yes, there's obstacles. Yes, there's problems. Your problem may be unique to you, and it probably is unique to you. But problems themselves are not unique to you, just the one you got. Yes. And God has got the answer for it. Yes. But you're complaining. You're feeling sorry for yourself. Yes. Your giving up is not the answer. No. No, no. Now's the time. What did he say? Fight the fight of faith. Now, I would, I would suggest to you if it's a fight the fight of faith, that means there's going to be some blows exchanged. Yes. Amen. You're going to take some and you're going to give some. The good news is when the... Swinging's done, you're the one left standing. That is right. That is right. Praise the Lord. We are in a world that is cursed and, and under a curse, amen, outside of Christ. So come on, man up, everybody, and, and realize there is a struggle. But we are victorious. But you don't win by complaining and giving up. You do not get the victory, amen, by saying, well, it doesn't work for me. Well, you just prophesied your result. Yes. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yes. Amen. And I'm going to keep on keeping on with these things until I am literally in the physical presence of God. Yes. Praise the Lord. Uh, you know what? <laughs> Praise the Lord. I don't know who said this. I can't remember now. But, and I know it's not literally true, but yet to me, there's real significance to it. And that is, God hates a coward. I know he doesn't hate cowards. But that's the way I've always thought about it. Yeah. Amen? I'm not worming out of this thing. I'm not giving up. I'm not cowarding out. I'm in it for the long haul. I signed up for the duration, and I ain't leaving until we get the results. And the result is victory, yes. ultimate victory in yes. every area of our lives. Yes. So I'm saying just, you know what? Bite your lip. You know, just suck it up and say, the hell, I'm not giving up. I'm not done. Look, we've, we've all, and I, I don't want to use all the military analogies, but listen, the Marine Corps was a, had a powerful influence in my life. I didn't like a lot of it, but it, 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 it reinforced a lot of the things that I was taught as a kid. Amen. And that is sometimes you just got to tough it up. Sometimes you just got to shut up and do it. You know, you just got to, you don't have the answer. You, you may not like it, but sometimes... This is the best thing to do is just get it done. Just get her done, you know. I mean, just go on and do it. Yeah. That's it. And God has a way of using us and our lives in a way, our natural lives, to help develop our spiritual lives, just with the blind man. So some of the things I confronted as a kid or in the military or whatever it was, was all about, you know, I thought it was about being macho or being tough. That's bogus, and we all know that we can all be cowards at any time. But the truth is, what God was teaching me was persistence, to not give up, to just stick it out. You know, I mean, you get, you're in the military, you don't get a choice. You don't get to discharge yourself. You know, I mean, you don't get to just go away and not do it anymore. So you're stuck with it. Mike could testify to this. So I say, praise the Lord, brother. But you just do it. You just do it. And a lot of times you don't understand it. And they're not going to explain it to you. You know, you've got all the explanation you need, and that is do it. 
Right? And sometimes I wonder if God doesn't... You know, He is our commander-in-chief, is He not? He is the Lord over all. Yes. He, he, he has an angelic army, like no army that this earth has ever known. Right. And man, when He says yes, amen, right? When He says jump, they say how high, you know, where, what, whatever. They just know to do it. Come on, man. If we have that kind of respect, if we can have that kind of respect for natural leaders... How much more for our Heavenly Father? Amen. We need to just strap it up and get on with it. Do what we got to do. Amen. I don't mean to be phony. You got Look, we all got personal time. We can feel sorry for ourselves alone. I do. You can sit around and whine about you know, why things aren't happening. You don't do that with other people. At least I don't. I'm a hypocrite. Praise the Lord. No, I mean, I, we all got doubts. But when you start opening your mouth and sharing them, you're confessing crap that's going to get you nothing but more what you already don't want. You know, it'd be, it's, okay, with, I'm stuck with this analogy here, but it'd be like me saying, okay, my, my CO says, okay, uh, Sergeant, I want you and three men, and you're going to go out here and do this, and, and I want you to take this thing. Do whatever you got to do, but I, I want you to be standing there when we get there. I want you to take that territory, that piece of property, that ground, that bunker, that whatever it is, okay? Well, oh, aye, aye, sir, and so away we go, and the guys that are with me, and I'm going, what the? He, is he an idiot? Doesn't he know anything? What, who is that moron, and why is he giving us these orders? Now, how much confidence are these other people going to have when I've already undermined everything that the guy told us to do, who is supposed to be in charge? You see what I'm saying? So sometimes when we, the best thing to do is shut up and just do the job. Just go do it. Amen. And the best that you can. Yep. Yes. You may not be perfect, but you know what God likes? He likes to see, will they trust me? Yep. Will they give it? Because it's not us that's doing it. It's our obedience to him that makes it come to pass, that makes what he has already done manifest. Yeah. And I hope I made some sense to you this morning. I know I've rambled on and on and on, but look. He has opened our spiritual eyes yes, he has. so that we can be everything that He's promised us to be. Yes. He's given us promises all the way back to Genesis. Yes. And they're still valid. Yes. They're still in effect for us. Yes. The only one that's been satisfied is sin. Right. The covenant of the law against sin. Right. That has been fulfilled. The others are still ours. Yes. But we still get them the same way. Yes. By faith. By believing, by trusting that what God said must come to pass. Why did he say it? Not for him, not to show himself mighty, although it does. But he did it to show us how much he loves us. Yes. Praise the Lord. So I say this week, let's go out. Uh, let's toughen up a little bit. Yes. Amen. I'm not saying it's wrong to have questions. That's why I started the way I did. I'm not saying it's wrong to, to wonder. I'm saying it's wrong to question out loud what God has declared. It just shows your, it shows your ignorance. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, what the, that's how Jesus had to feel about these disciples when they're saying, well, why, how come he's blind? Was it his mom? Was it his dad? Was it him? The best thing they could have done, just like so many other cases... The best thing they could have done was shut up. Because the more they talked, the more they showed how little they understood about what Jesus was trying to do in their lives. If you can't say what he says, don't say it. Praise the Lord. Amen. Give the Lord a hand clap. I'll stop. Amen. Amen. I'm saying all this not as a rebuke, not as a challenge, uh, so much as it is to say that, look, all I'm hearing is what God's wanting to do. And what God has promised, and every one of us feel this inside, that we know that there's something on the horizon, if you will, if there's something just waiting to, to explode. And I believe that it's, this is the part of the issue God is bringing us and has brought us all over our lifetime to a place where He can show Himself mighty, where He can reveal Himself to us. Yes. 
personally so that we can reveal it to the people that are around us. He's going to do it. And bless God, I want to be in that number, praise God, when he does it. And I think that's what all of this is leading up to. He's getting ready to pour out a blessing on this earth and to pour out his presence in a way that has never been experienced before. Amen. And somebody's got to be believing for it. Somebody has to be standing in faith and saying, though these skin worms devour this flesh, yet I will stand in the presence of the Lord. I will see the Lord. Praise God. Amen. All right. I'm done. Praise God. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Right. And if you think it's the wrath of God, then you're going to sit back and say, not what you can get this thing. If you will make a stand. Yeah. And the devil's out there trying to kill your joy. Yeah, you know, he is. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Yes. yes.